Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best minds in the sport so you can train smarter, stay healthy, and run faster now. And now your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir, and I would like to welcome you to another episode of the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast. There are many topics that are covered over and over again, and some that you can ask someone about or type into a search engine and almost hear the crickets as you realise there is nothing on that topic. Runners are dedicated, determined and love to research what they can do to run faster, so why is there absolutely nothing on women's issues and running? If you're a guy, you may want to switch off now, but it would also be a great idea for you to listen to this interview to learn more about it. And to the female listeners, this may be a first ever for how deep and detailed we go into this topic, but it will be informative and I'm sure you will learn something valuable that you can apply to your training. My guest today is Sarah Crouch. Sarah is a coach for Runners Connect. She works with a big group of athletes in our training program. She's a 13-time All-American and now a professional runner for Zap and Reebok, which she has been since 2011. Sarah is a three times Olympic trials qualifier and has PRs of 1549 in the 5K, 3237 in the 10K, and 232 in the marathon. That's fast. However, one of Sarah's biggest accomplishments is being the overall winner of the 2013 church baking contest with her luscious blueberry pie. As you can see, Sarah's a good deal of fun. Today, Sarah and I are going to talk about. The effects, both good and bad, of various forms of birth control on runners. The two types of amenorrhea and why you need to pay more attention to ovulation rather than just having a period. Why hormones and women's cycles are not talked about more in our society. Why you should not be worried about looking like a runner and why dropping weight quickly is just not worth it. What supplements are important for women and how to take them for maximum effectiveness and, of course, minimalising your stomach upsets. And the effect your cycle has on your racing and how you can even make slight manipulations to make sure you are not on your period during a race. Many of you requested more insight into the lives of the Runners Connect coaches and many more of you requested looks into female-related issues. Well, your wish is my command. Let's do both. Let's meet Sarah. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast, Sarah. Oh, hi. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. And uh, for our listeners that don't know, Sarah and I are actually uh, good friends. We've been friends for, what, about seven years now? Five years? <laughs> Long Something time. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, we both actually ran in a Division two school in college, and we got to know each other well there, and we've kind of kept in touch um, over the years. Uh, I last saw Sarah in, at Chicago Marathon in the fall, but um, it's been going to be exciting to catch up a little here and kind of hear your insights into some of the topics we're going to go over today. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so um, before we get started, do you want to um, just tell us a little bit about who Sarah Crouch is? Absolutely. Um, when you first met me, I was Sarah Porter. I've since been married. Um, I began running uh, as, a, as a teenager, just totally fell in love with it, ran all the way through college, and then um, kind of made a, a jump in performances my senior year, which enabled me to, um, to run professionally. So I've been doing that for about four years. Um, but in the past few years, I've really um, found that I enjoy coaching as well. I love sharing the passion and um, and mostly just informing runners of, of how to get better, how to get the most out of their own running. I think that's a very rewarding rewarding thing to do. Yeah, great. And uh, Sarah is one of the Runners Connect coaches, so uh, she actually works with quite a lot of uh, the people on the team, and uh, I'm sure quite a lot of our listeners right now know Sarah quite well, so they'll be excited to hear more from you. Um, so today, Sarah and I thought we would dive into something that isn't really talked about too much, but we think we want to get it out in the open and we've had quite a few requests um, to talk about this topic. So um, I'm just going to go back in time a bit, Sarah. We um, About a year or so ago, uh, I was in a Facebook conversation uh, message with um, Sarah and uh, I think she invited, I think it was about 60 female runners um, to talk about uh, contraception, about uh, periods, about um, basically women's issues and how they affect your body as a runner. So um do you want to kind of tell us a bit more background about what that was? First? Yeah, so I think it was about two years ago. Um, I was getting married, and I wanted to find a very solid form of, of birth control. But as a professional runner, I was very nervous 
um, about taking something hormonal that could potentially affect my running. Um, and as I began to to do some research online, what really shocked me was the lack of research um, that is available today. Um, even you know, googling something as simple as you know birth control for runners and just blank pages or, or pages that had really nothing to do with it, and, and I was um, just I was just floored by the fact that no one had really uh, delved into this this topic um, because it is something that women runners uh, they definitely need to consider. As they as they look towards uh, using a, a type of birth control, so I decided that the best thing I could do was use the resources at my fingertips, which were the other um, professional runners and and you know p- women that I knew who who made running more than a habit; it was a lifestyle to these women. Um, so I sent out this Facebook message and uh, to about sixty women, and I, I just kind of phrased the question. Um, how many of you have experience with different types of birth control and what have you noticed about how it's affected your running? And immediately I started getting just response after response and a lot of the women were just like, wow, I'm so glad this thread has been started because I've tried to do research. I haven't been able to find any. Um, And I was able to find out a lot of information regarding several different types of birth control. Um, And then it got a little bit deeper than that even about how the actual fertility cycle itself uh, can affect your running. So that kind of sparked uh, this interest in me. And, and I think that um, now, two years later, having done a fair amount of research on it, other than, you know, running itself, um, fertility is probably the thing that I, I know the most about, mm-hmm. um, simply because I, I find it fascinating. But um, yeah, I was just very, very pleased to get a lot of good feedback from these women and uh, uh, just a lot of new information that I, th- I felt need to be shared. So I turned it into an article and I, and I put it out there for people to read. Mm-hmm. And where can people find that, just for future reference? I published that article through Runners Connect, um, mm-hmm. though, the, honestly, the probably the easiest way uh, to find it would be to go to Google and type in uh, the effect of various types of birth control on runners, and it'll pop right up, because that's the title. Okay, and I will put a link to that, just uh, if, also another easy method, uh, if uh, our listeners want to go to runnersconnect.net forward slash rc60, there will be a link to that as well, there also. Um, so would you be able to tell us some of the, uh, like the big findings that you did find through your research? Yeah. Yeah. So one that I had kind of suspected, um, was that runners who chose to be on the birth control pill. Now there are obviously very many types of, uh, birth control pills or oral contraceptives. Um, but the vast amount of side effects, um, that these women were experiencing was, I mean, it was, it was a lot to take <laughs> in because women who are not in touch with their bodies, um, they may be able to take birth control, not really notice a difference, whether it's, you know, um, slightly bigger breasts, a little bit more weight, uh, feeling lethargic. Um, as one runner lovingly put it, she said, moody and puffy. Uh, <laughs> that that uh, runners, we are, we are trained to listen to our body. We are trained to pay attention to, um, to how different stimulus a- affects our body. And so when we take um, something like the pill, we are hypersensitive to how it affects us. So I was able to glean a lot of information. And I will say that probably 90% of the women who were taking the pill um, had at least one negative side effect. I, I can think of one woman who is now the current um, 100K US record holder who was talking about a, a very, very low uh, and she didn't experience any side effects. But she also had been taking it for so long that she didn't remember what it was like not to take it. Um, but that was, to me, the number one finding was that the birth control pill itself was not the best choice for runners. Oh, that's interesting. And uh, did you you looked into various types of birth control? Like, did you find that one was was there one that was particularly troublesome, or was it kind of across the board? It was all had you different know, in, things. In general, I think the the higher hormone dose, uh, the the more effective it's going to be in terms of in terms of the side effects. Mm-hmm. Um, the one that I, I felt was most raved about for runners was the IUD uh, Paragard. Now, for those of you that don't know, an IUD is basically um, a small device. You can't feel it. It's placed inside the uterus, and there's basically two different types. There are uh, a copper IUDs like Paragard, which is the most popular copper IUD. It's placed in the uterus. It stays there for about ten years. Uh, non-hormonal. Um, and that one was the one that uh, a lot of runners absolutely recommended. They said it, it's great because it's non-hormonal, so it doesn't affect your body or your horm- hormone levels. But um, the downside of Paragard, the copper IUD, was that it can create heavier periods. And for some athletes who have, um, I mean, I, I'm someone who I cramp quite a bit on my period, um, and it creates heavier periods and more cramping, which if you have to deal with that on race day, 
uh, it's not such a great option. Now, for someone who has a very, very light period and minimal cramping, that may not be such a big deal. Uh, but for the IUD Mirena, which is a five-year hormonal IUD, um, and I know several women, several runners who use that as well. And it is hormonal, so it may have a few side effects, not as dramatic as the pill. Um, but it, it also, um, because it is not copper and it is um, slightly hormonal, it lessens uh, your period. So it can make it lighter and less cramps, which is great for running. Mm -hmm. So those were the IUDs uh, that we discussed. And then we also talked about just uh, general um, use of like condoms and diaphragms and other non-hormonal methods, which although they are a hassle, um, they are definitely uh, the safest in terms of a running standpoint. They're not going to affect you in any way, shape, or form. Okay, great. That's good to know. And um, when it comes to uh, birth control pills, did you find that uh, anything about the longer you're on it, the more issues there are? Or was it they're not really a difference once you were on it, you're kind of on it? Did people tend to have more issues the longer they were on it? or? Yeah, um, it's it's interesting. There was a few women who had been on it for years and years and years, and then when they went off it, it's all of a sudden they they had this this resurgence of their running. They felt, and it's it's strange how it would affect you emotionally. But a lot of these women um, noticed that once they got off the pill, um, even though they've been on it for so long, they didn't notice the side effects anymore. Um, they lost a little bit of weight. They gained a, a competitive edge um, mm -hmm. because many of the women they weren't able to really put it into words, but they said that the pill, it just made them feel kind of off. Okay. Um, it's hard to explain, but just they didn't have that um, that aggression. It's kind of like uh, the, the few days that you start your period, you you have this release of progesterone and testosterone, which, uh, which kind of in a way actually gives you a bit of a competitive edge, mm -hmm. um, which is a good thing. But having a, a pill that is um, pumping estrogen and other hormones into your body, it, it removes that. So it kind of takes away a few of the benefits of your yep. cycle, actually. Huh. Interesting. Um, I think that's good for our listeners to know. And not. And I just want to kind of say that, um, you know, even though Sarah was talking to elite runners and uh, we are kind of talking both of us as elite runners, you, this isn't just for elite runners. I mean, this could this is a conversation for all women. You know, it, if you are a runner and the, if you are listening to this, the chances are you uh, unless we have some guys out there who are particularly interested in this, <laughs> um, you're most, most likely to be um a female runner who is interested in running you love running for the sport of it and you want to be the best you can be so we are kind of talking about this from a standpoint of anyone who is a runner you know no one really wants those side effects so this is kind of for everyone so don't you know feel like you have to switch off right now because uh hopefully you will pick up a lot of interesting uh thoughts on this from this interview um, Absolutely. I mean, I think every woman deserves to feel at her her best self, you mm -hmm. know, and, and choosing a correct form of birth control can certainly contribute to that. Yeah, definitely. So um, let's kind of uh, dive into this a little bit deeper and kind of did you find anything about uh, amenorrhea during your research or other kind of issues that came with um, uh, oh, absolutely. birth control yeah. or other forms? Um, you know, I think it's, it's – there is a huge stereotype that um, – runners in general, like a lot of people who are not elite runners or not runners at all, um, they assume that runners, that no runners have their period. Um, and certainly that, the spectrum of amenorrhea and the, and the menstrual cycle is, um, it's absolutely across the board. I know runners who run, you know, 40 miles a week and do not have, get a period. And then there's runners like myself who've run up to 140 miles a week, never lost a period. Um, so I, I certainly, I mean, amenorrhea is definitely, it's a touchy subject because um, there is this big assumption that um, if you're not getting a period, you're not healthy. Now, certainly um, there are women who do not get a period because they don't have enough fat in their bodies. And just to kind of break it down how it works, if you imagine holding um, a glass of water that's not quite full and then you start to move your hand side to side so the water's sloshing up on each side until finally you move your hand hard enough that the water sloshes over. Well, your your cycle kind of works that way. Um, your body tries to build up. It needs to build up certain levels of estrogen in order to ovulate. Now, eating enough fat um, and 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 not stressing can can help to push those levels higher and higher and higher. Um, but for a certain reason, if you're not able to, um, let's say you're you're busy, you're training, 
Um, you're traveling. There's a lot of stress on your body. You're not eating enough fat. It's like waves. They're trying to build up and up and up, but you're not able to crest that hill in order to ovulate. Mm -hmm. um, so that can be. Um, so I guess it's it's fair to kind of define it in two separate categories: amenorrhea due to lack of ovulation, and then uh, simple amenorrhea, meaning the loss of the period, which can happen for runners who um, who still ovulate, but they simply they don't get a period. So ovulation is really the thing that you need to be aware of. You can still um, be ovulating and not necessarily be bleeding once a month, but making sure that you're ovulating, that is a way to tell if your body is healthy or not. And there's a very simple way to do that. Um, if you chart your basal body temperature, if you wake up every morning and you, um, you, you take your temperature and then you record it. So, um, throughout the first half of the cycle, meaning day one is the start of your period or wherever you want to start your cycle. Um, if you go ahead and start taking your body temperature, the day that you ovulate, you're, you will notice a dramatic increase in your body temperature. And from that point on through the rest of your cycle, it will stay at that high level. So what you will see in that essence is kind of a stair step if you were to chart it out on an actual chart. And so if you are not noticing that, that stair step, if you just have a simple flat line, then you're not ovulating and you certainly need to, um, to figure out why. Wow, that's interesting. So uh, people could do that for like a month straight just to kind of, if if you are Absolutely. suffering from this. Okay. Yeah, good. yeah. And the other two ways that you can tell, and we're about to get, uh, we're about to get real. So uh, <laughs> you guys are squeamish at all. We'll go ahead and tune out right now. But, um, the two other ways that you can tell if you are ovulating would be a cervical discharge and then cervical position. Um, so if you know how to, how to feel your cervix, how to actually find it, um, during the first, during most of your cycle, um, your cervix is going to be lower. It's going to actually uh, be a little bit lower, a little bit easier to find if you reach up into the vagina, and it should feel um, a little bit hard, like almost the way that the tip of your nose feels. Whereas when you ovulate, it raises up. It's a little bit harder to reach, and it becomes soft the way that your lips feel. Hmm. So women, it's interesting. We are actually only fertile about twenty-five percent of our cycle, and that is. Um, the days right before uh, we ovulate and then the day that we ovulate. And during that time, your cervix is going to be higher and it's going to be softer and a little bit open. And that is to uh, to make it easier for you to get pregnant, frankly. That's what your body's trying to do. And then obviously, um, cervical di discharge is something that is a very, it's very key to, to ovulation. Um, there are even tribes in Africa who still today, um, when their women become of age, get their first period, they hand them a smooth uh, round stone and say, this is the key to your fertility. And these women um, use this uh, smooth black stone to wipe um, the opening of the vagina to see the, the cervical discharge. So throughout the month, you will notice as you approach ovulation, you will have a buildup of, of discharge. And it will start out becoming um, more and more clear and more and more um, slippery. So that's a totally normal part of your cycle, which most women, again, it's, it seems to be very taboo in our culture. We treat mm -hmm. it, oh, as a bad thing. It's gross. We shouldn't be doing this. Um, but in fact, it's as natural to your body as breathing. So if you're experiencing a buildup of discharge and a changing in your cervical position once a month, you are ovulating and you are healthy. Okay, good to know. And so when you say about the discharge, that's just, uh, so if someone is having discharge, um, you know, that's kind of showing that you are ovulating or is it, you know? Absolutely. Now, as okay. I, as I expressed earlier with those waves of getting closer to ovulation, it's mm -hmm. possible that you could be having slight discharge as your body's trying to ovulate and mm -hmm. it will start out, um, almost being like the consistency of lotion. But if you are ovulating the day of ovulation, it should be almost the consistency of like an egg white and that okay. is uh, ovulation discharge. Yes. Oh, interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, you did say, um, that, you know, it's almost taboo in our uh, culture. And that was going to be one of my questions. I was going to save it kind of towards the end, but maybe we'll talk about it now instead. Why is it you think no one talks about this? You know, we are getting more open in our culture. So hopefully this is going to mean that it is discussed more and more. But, um, you know, like you mentioned earlier, you had typed into Google uh, a few times or, you know, I don't know if it's changed since then. But why do you think, you know, no one really talks about this? And it's such a, such a, um, unspoken about thing for something that is so normal, like you say. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's sad to me that it is taboo, but I will say that probably 99 times out of a hundred, when I get an email, uh, from a woman asking me a question about her period, about her cycle, um, about anything like that, 99 times out of a hundred, that email starts with an apology. She says, Oh, I'm so sorry if this is too much information, but, mm -hmm. and then asks the question. And I think it is that attitude um, that really kind of promotes the idea that um, the fertility cycle, menstruation, ovulation, that it's kind of, um, it's dirty. We don't talk about it. And it's sad in the year 2015 when we look at 
you know, a hundred years ago, the first wave of feminism and uh, Mar Margaret Sanger coined the term birth control for the first time. We've come a long way since then. Mm -hmm. um, we've gone through a few waves of feminism. And as you mentioned, I do believe that we are now kind of in a resurgence um, of women pushing the idea that this needs to be something that um, that we discuss because not only is it as natural to our bodies as breathing, but it's also um, something that is it's like the building block of life. It's it's um, I don't I don't think it's gross at all. I think it's it's fascinating and it should be talked about. But um, but sadly, it's just something that we have been uh, we have been always taught to suppress. Like I don't know um, who first talked to you about periods, but mm -hmm. um, I remember my mom kind of being really embarrassed and having to bring it <laughs> up. And and in in school, it's like they herded all the girls in this little section where there were whispers and they discussed, you know, your changing body. Yeah. Um, I think that it's just something that's very perpetuated in our culture, but I hope that, you know, podcasts like this and, and um, articles like the one I put out will start to change that. Yeah, definitely. And I, I do think things are starting to change and um, I, I'm hoping that it continues that way, especially with the kind of movement uh, there is right now about, um, different body types different especially within the running world different yeah you know, body types different shapes sizes height you know and you actually uh discuss this kind of let's take a side uh road for a minute here um you actually discuss this in a coaches chat uh for those who don't know every week sarah does a um coach chat with the uh is it just the runners connect athletes or is it um, um, I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, with the runners connect athletes about various topics and last week she was talking about um individuality and how you know people think oh I'm you know to insert here to be a runner you know you have to look like um you know a uh, tall skinny whatever whatever your perspective is of a runner but you think that you don't look like a runner but Sarah was talking about how you know there's all kinds of different shapes and sizes and I hope you won't mind me saying Sarah but both Sarah and I are not what I would say a typical runner looks like we're both quite short we're both kind of a bit stocky, <laughs> stocky kind of uh short legs and uh not kind of the typical runner look but you know we both have managed to run pretty fast and uh I think it's important to kind of uh go over that we you know the, the culture is changing things are changing especially within the running world that you know we can talk about other things you don't have to look a certain way you don't have to be embarrassed about who you are so I think hopefully this is all going to kind of come together but did you want to add anything to that about yeah I mean there certainly is a misconception among uh runners and non-runners alike that um to be a fast runner you have to look a certain way but I, I do believe that this affects women more than it affects uh men um, and simply because I, I don't ever want to go into a race and look at someone and give them the victory simply because they look like they're faster than me. Um, I remember back in college, I had a race at the Mount Sac Relays where I was entered in a 10K and I remember warming up for this race and like uh, Tina mentioned, for, for whatever reason, I, I, that's just, that will never be my body type. I'm not the tall, thin runner. Um, I'm about five foot two. My weight fluctuates drastically. Um, but I, I would consider myself on the curvaceous side of an elite athlete. Um, and I'm 100% fine with that. But uh, mm -hmm. as I was warming up for that 10K, I remember seeing these beautiful tall girls who looked like gazelles. Um, and I was just so intimidated and I thought, wow, I just hope I don't get last in this race. And I ended up winning and lapping some of those women. And as I passed them, I thought, you know what, Sarah, never again, never again, um, <laughs> say that someone looks faster than you because that, that doesn't make any sense. No one looks faster than anyone else. Everyone just looks a different way. Um, so I do want to encourage, especially women not to have, um, a preconceived notion, never to, to surrender anything to yourself to say, um, oh, I'm too X, you know, to be fast. I have too big of hips. I have too short of legs um, because you don't. And you can certainly, you know, stand by the sidelines of a marathon and watch the runners go by and see every every type of body shape that there is. And that's one of the beautiful things about our sport is that there really isn't um, a set body type for success. Mm -hmm, definitely. And I think actually we might keep going for the, with this just for a few more minutes and then we'll go, and go back towards what we were discussing earlier. But um, just kind of wanted to ask your thoughts, kind of if you had some uh, insight and just kind of what you thought about. Um, there is a lot of um, incidents with eating disorders in our culture right now, uh, especially in the running world. And, you know, um, I'm sure you do. And I get quite a lot of messages and emails from uh, younger girls, particularly high school and early college years saying, you know, um, I really want to look like this. I'm, I see this person who's running really fast and, uh, you know, that they're really skinny. I need to lose weight and all this kind of thing. And, um, you know, we've talked about how you've got to embrace your own individuality. But um, 
I kind of wanted, to, I thought you would have some insight here into, um, if you look at the world of elite running, those girls that um, are especially thin who may have run fast in college, it's not sustainable. That and, is exactly, yeah. exactly. Do you want to kind of talk a bit about that from your opinion? I think I think that what you just hit on is absolutely the key, um, is that it's it's not sustainable. There certainly is, I mean, I'd be lying if I said there wasn't success to dropping weight fast because there are certainly women who um, who drop a ton of weight. It obviously having a lower body mass increases your VO two max. Um, it makes you lighter. You're just simply uh, it's it's you know it's just less to carry um, from point A to point B. However, um, I can't tell you how many times I've seen women go down this path um, where they shed more weight than they should. And then, um, you know, roughly a year to 18 months later, they're not running anymore. These women, um, they, they become, um, just broken down. They get injured. Um, they, some of them are just flat out, excuse me, uh, just flat out miserable because they can't, um, you know, they can't, uh, eat the way that their body is telling them to. And so, um, you know, and I, and I, I don't know. I just feel like it's something that, um, in our culture is, it's such a cliche, but it's sadly true, um, that there are, you are going to see women, you are going to see elite women runners, um, with eating disorders, but anyone who has stood the test of time, um, is not going to have an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. If you want to have longevity in your career, if you want to see your success, um, for years and years and years and improve a little bit at a time rather than have one great year and then burn out forever, um, you cannot go down that path. And I can't stress that enough. I, I get emails. I got an email that made me so sad. It was a high school girl who said, hi, I'm trying to get faster. I've started to limit myself to, you know, um, 1600 calories a day. What else can I do? I'm starting to feel dizzy. And I just wrote her, I said, throw out your scale and eat more. Like, I don't know what else. To yeah, say. yeah. That's frankly what you need to do. And, and, um, I've lined up against those girls. I've been beaten by those girls. And then years later, they're no longer running. And I am. And, um, and I'm always every year I've gotten you know faster than I was the year before, so um, it's just more important to to have that longevity in the sport. And frankly, it's just for your mental peace of mind. Um, it is it is absolutely a slippery slope that is not worth going down. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, I I just kind of want to um, say you know I write about this in uh, on my personal blog a bit uh, actually quite a lot recently. Um, but something that um, is important to talk about is that. You know, we're not we're not saying that if you are, um, you know, if you are the tall, thin runner that, you know, that is your body type. We're not saying there's anything wrong with that. But what we're talking about is the sudden drop in weight, the restriction, the, you know, even as elites, both Sarah and I do indulge in things. You know, I know I love a good burger. I have a wicked sweet tooth and I know you enjoy <laughs> those things, too. But we're not we're not saying that to be fast, you have to um, restrict Um and I can bring up a really good example yeah. of that is actually um, Dina Castor. You know, yeah. I, I simply I don't have Dina Castor's body type. Um, she is very very thin, and yet I've I've been to Mammoth. I've run with her. I went out to breakfast with her, and I watched her put down the biggest burrito I've ever seen. And then she was hungry <laughs> immediately after. That woman eats. It's simply her body type. So if you have that noodle thin body type, that's not a bad thing either. Yeah. Um, there are several women I know who get accused of anorexia, and they are not anorexic. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a, a it's a like you will you know if you're not eating enough and those women are certainly eating enough so mm -hmm. yep and um you know it, it, at the end of the day it kind of comes down to what matters more to you do you want to um run for life and um you know maybe be a little heavier or maybe be a little different to the person standing next to you on the start line or do you want to like sarah said have that one you know year of success but then you're either you know so far down that spiral that you literally don't have enough energy to run you're injured or you're burned out like what what matters to you more is it you know short-term success or do you want to run for life that's that's really what it what it comes down to here absolutely so. yeah and if you're if you're running enough if you're running enough mileage you're training hard your body is going to find its own comfortable set weight at which you should be training and racing um so if you're if you are a runner who is just starting out and you are looking to lose weight um, give it time, allow it to happen. Running will slowly forge your body mm -hmm. into, um, you know, an efficient running machine. It takes time. Um, but you will eventually get down to the shape that you're supposed to be. And, and for some of us, that doesn't mean being 95 pounds and yeah. that's okay. Yeah. And, um, can I, do, can you just kind of reiterate, you did say this earlier, but, um, you know, and that also doesn't mean staying one weight all year round. Like I know I fluctuate from, you know, um, around, I mean, I have, I have, I'm not embarrassed to say this, but I, I fluctuate. I'm five foot five from around 113 to around 118, which is what I am now. I just ran London and I took my time off. 
Um, and, you know, I, I don't mind saying that, but, um, you know, your weight doesn't stay the same year round either. And I think you can agree with that there. Oh, absolutely. And I'm, again, I'm, I think I'm about three inches shorter than you and my weight fluctuates. <laughs> I've seen it about 112 and I've seen it down to like 98 after a particularly long, long run. Um, the thing is, yeah, my, my weight fluctuates by about maybe 14 pounds, but mm-hmm. I don't own a scale here. I, mm-hmm. I don't ever plan to own a scale. Um, I was curious after a long run I did before Chicago, we had a scale at Zap and I knew that it was hot, it was humid. Um, I had sweated off about eight pounds and so I got on the scale and saw 98 and I immediately ate and drank. <laughs> um, but you know, being a slave to your scale is just about, um, that is one of the worst addictions I can think of for a runner is being mm-hmm. uh, stuck in the numbers. Rather than focusing on a number that you want to see on the scale, what is it that you want your body to do for you? I want my body to be able to run fast. That's what I want, you know. So find out what it is you want your body to do um, and focus more on that than on the, the number on the scale. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, you, you've got to ask yourself and be real, you know, if if the way you look and how you look in a bikini is your priority, you know, that that is okay. But if you want to run fast, you have to be able to listen to your body and take in what your body needs to be able to do that. So you, you really have to prioritize what what matters to you. Uh-huh. Absolutely. And along those lines, if what is important to you is is looking good, um, there are ways to do that without cutting calories. For instance, if you're someone who eats breakfast, lunch, and dinner, um, you know what you're experiencing in these large meals is a hypoglycemic spike in blood sugar. And you see that three times throughout the day. So your body is basically, um, it's binging and then it's starving, binging, starving throughout the day. So it learns how to store, um, to store what you eat as fat. But if you are someone who wants to, to look lean, to have muscle definition, eating even calories, the same amount of calories, whatever you're eating, but just spaced out throughout the day, you have a steady intake of energy, no hypoglycemic spikes, and it starts to store your food as lean muscle. So there you go, that you can do that without eliminating a meal a day. Oh, interesting. I did not know that myself. Um, Okay, so let's kind of head back to where we were. So um, yeah, you know, as you, if you do limit yourself, if you do restrict yourself, one of the side effects is likely to be amenorrhea, which we were talking about. Um, and can you, do you want to just talk about some of the other dangers? Like, you know, what is so bad about someone not having their period? Right. So, um, when you have your period or basically after you ovulate, after you pass your luteal phase and you begin a new cycle, whether or not that involves bleeding or not, um, you, that is the, the point at time at which your, your bones are intaking calcium. So it's the point at which, at which your, your bones calcify, they become stronger. Um, so what happens is when women are unable to ovulate, Um, they do not go through that phase. Uh, They kind of skip that phase and they are forever in the follicular phase, um, which means that they are not intaking the correct amount of calcium into their bones and that leads to osteoporosis. This is why so often you see girls who who go the route of anorexia, lose their periods, um, they end up with stress fractures because Mm -hmm. their bones weaken. Um, I remember in particular one girl who was, she was a wonderful runner in high school and um, she went to college and uh, she lost a lot of weight rapidly. And during a race, she was pushed from behind and it actually broke her back because um, she, huh. there, she went to the doctor and the doctor said, you have like the bones of a 70 or 80 year old woman, like you, uh. you cannot physically do this. Um, so it's something that can dramatically affect your bone density. And that to me is probably the largest danger of amenorrhea. But also you start to get into issues with, um, if you're not ovulating, obviously that means you are infertile, you are not able to have a child. Um, and so if it's, you know, childbearing is something in your future, making sure that you're, even if you're not necessarily bleeding, that you're at least ovulating, Mm -hmm. uh, um, during your cycle. And that, that means that you are fertile in fact, but, um, so fertility, uh, bone density, um, simply having balanced hormone levels is, is important for a number of reasons. If you are imbalanced, it can cause you to, uh, lose hair off your head, grow hair places on your body, Mm -hmm. um, all sorts of messed up issues with your your skin you can be cold all the time Uh, it's just one of those things that you don't want to mess with because it it sets off a chain reaction yeah definitely I I agree with that and uh, you know she's brought up many good points there and um, so if someone is having an issue would you recommend they get uh, you know I I know I have had uh, blood work hormone work you know checking actually inside to make sure everything's going on uh, bone density tests are there any other tests you think people should check out or you know speak to their doctor about you know, uh, to me, I, I feel like the most important thing to do is to get in tune with your own body, um, mm-hmm. which means, um, and then the one book that I have to recommend um, is called Taking Charge of Your Fertility. It's by Tony Weschler. And um, this book explains all about how to um, interpret the signs that your body is producing, such as the ones I mentioned, cervical position, cervical fluid, 
um, and body temperature because the number one thing to figure out is um, if you are ovulating mm -hmm. or not, and if, if you're if you're not ovulating, then that um, then that likely means that you are not um, getting enough fat in your diet. And so, one thing that I've I've heard uh, recommended is if you are not ovulating and you're concerned about it, go for about five or six weeks and and make fat like good fat such as like avocado, Greek yogurt, nuts, fish. Um, make that 65 percent of your diet. And, and see if that helps bring you back to ovulation because a lot of the time what happens is people assume that they need to cut fat out of their diet mm -hmm. in order to lose weight um, when in fact it's the opposite. If you're running and you're eating a lot of fat, that in turn teaches your body how to burn fat. So fat loading is something that you actually should be doing basically all the time but um, adding a fair amount of fat to your diet can help. Uh, can help regulate things um, if, if need be going on you know talking to a fertility expert and going on a pill that will help to bring back a period just to make sure that everything's on the level and there's not anything more serious going on um, but if, if it's something again I'm not a doctor I'm not a fertility <laughs> expert yeah um, but I would recommend you know figuring out your own body and seeing what your issues are if you're if you're having issues at all mm -hmm. yeah yep and I think that might be kind of difficult I think we're starting to come out of this but you know in the past uh it was definitely a um fat is bad do not eat fats if you want like you said if you want to lose weight cut fats out but I think it is important important to you know uh re-emphasize that that you know the more fats you do eat the you're probably going to be better off for it and you know that when we say fat we're not talking about the same kind of fat that you know you see um excess this is a different uh, we're talking about good fats here like Sarah mentioned um there's mm -hmm. plenty of sources of it but you know, we we did say that you weren't mishearing right there. It is good to get more fats into your diet, but good fats, good choices. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then other than that, uh, yeah, I, I would just suggest um, sooner rather than later. Like I, I, some of the women on the thread were posting, oh, I haven't had a period in four years and I don't know why. Um, go see somebody, find out why. Just uh, be proactive about it if you're concerned about it because the longer um, you put it off, the, the greater chances that um, – that you're going to have those bone density and fertility problems. Yeah, definitely. And uh, are there any other supplements or anything you've come across? I mean, I've heard about uh, taking calcium or making sure you keep that high because uh, I'm not sure if you know the exact number for this, but uh, from what I remember, you can only, uh, women continue or everyone continues strengthening their bones uh, up to age 30. And then after that, it kind of begins to decline. So uh, yeah, I've heard a few numbers. I've heard age 28. Um, I've heard as early as age 21, which I certainly hope is not true. <laughs> uh, but calcium supplements are something that are really important. A lot of women say, oh, well, once I hit menopause, I'll start taking supplements. But um, it is important that if, especially if you are amenorrheic or if you are not um, having a period, taking calcium is important. Um, now, again, you have the other side. I have one woman who I coach. She uh, bleeds for 11 days at the beginning of her cycle. So iron intake is extremely important for someone like that. If you have a particularly long period, you're losing a lot of blood. Um, or if you, like some women have ovulatory bleeding, which is they spot in the middle of their cycle. They, they bleed then as well. So whenever you're losing blood, you're losing iron. So making sure that you're taking iron supplements. But um, we just mentioned calcium. Don't take the two of them together because calcium prevents the absorption of iron. Um, and then I take personally, um, for, for a, a number of reasons, but I take B12. Um, B12 helps promote uh, nerve health and just does a lot of good things in general. Mm -hmm. um, I feel that I get enough vitamin D from being outside, but I do know athletes who take it. Yep. Um, fish oil is great. Um, I feel like there's one other one that I take that I'm forgetting. Well, it's probably because I forget to take it all the time. <laughs> uh, but that's uh, a few of the supplements that I take. Um, and I, I do want to I, I just mention that we're not specifically talking just about amenorrhea. We want to talk about the, yep. the cycle. So, And there's a lot of, um, of other issues. And if you don't mind, Tina, I'd actually like to talk about um, this athlete I just mentioned and something no, that she it. does. It's really interesting. Um, so this athlete, uh, the one who uh, – she has a very heavy cycle. But um, she and I have been discussing a lot lot about how there are in terms of running and racing there are kind of sweet spots in your cycle to race obviously when you um, are in your luteal phase which is after ovulation your body temperature is quite a bit higher and then right before your period you experience bloating the symptoms of PMS that is probably the worst time to race um, so one thing that this woman has been doing which I thought was really interesting I've never done it but um, she began to uh, to sort of manipulate the cycle in order to benefit her races. So she had she was running the Boston Marathon. So before Boston, at the beginning of her cycle, she started taking uh, the pill. Uh, I'm not sure. It was maybe um, Levlite or something like that. But she started taking the pill, and then eight days before Boston, she stopped taking the pill. And when she stopped taking it, <clears throat> she immediately got a period. 
And so that pushed her into the correct, she wanted to be in her follicular phase during the race. So that yeah. it helped her hormone levels be where they needed to be. So there are even ways to, um, and it's interesting because guys really don't have this option. They don't have a cycle and they think, oh, well, it's great. We don't have all the, the bad stuff that comes with it. Um, but there are certainly good things that come with it. Um, I think for me, roughly 80% of my PRs were set on my period simply because I'm aggressive, I'm competitive because of the, <laughs> um, the, the testosterone and progesterone. But um, it's very, very interesting to think that someone like that, like she can actually manipulate her cycle to be where she needs it to be. So if you're someone who struggles with that or you really don't want to be on your period during a race because it's a hassle, it's possible to kind of work with the system um, and move things around a bit. Okay. But again, someone should talk to their doctor or their gynecologist. Yes. yes. <laughs> This is not something you should just uh, just play with for fun. Yeah, let's just take some birth control pills and do it. Fertility <laughs> specialist, and she—I um, don't know if you if you wanted it, but she gave me like the name and, and number of her doctor. But I, I thought it wouldn't be good to post on the air because I don't want him getting a bunch of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I guess yeah. Look, look up your local uh, where you are, and I'm sure you have recommendations. I think that's something that's important is uh, for finding someone like this is listen to other people in the area. I'm sure you have even if they're not runners, other people that you know who have had a particularly good experience with a particular OBGYN or whatever it, whatever it may be. So make sure you check out um, your local area for that. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's just uh, go off a little bit into iron. You mentioned about um, taking iron supplements. And um, have you found any in your research, you know, obviously, like we said, you're not a doctor, but have you found uh, much about um the uh, presence of um, anemia or like how people can kind of tell if they're low, what numbers they need to pay attention to, um, anything on that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, uh, for women who don't take iron supplements, they need to be getting enough iron from their food. Um, now, women who have amenorrhea because of something like anorexia or because they're restricting calories or eating only you know fruits and vegetables, um, they're <laughs> not going to be getting Um, the amount of iron that they need into their system. So um, taking iron supplements, even if you're not anorexic, I mean, in general, taking iron supplements is very important. But having your blood work done every now and then um, is a really good indicator of of where you're at. Now, um, ferritin levels are kind of tricky because women in general tend to be a little bit lower than men. Um, but for me personally, I don't like to get below about 50. Now, if you, what happens is if you go in and you say, I I want my blood work done, they'll draw blood and then um, they will you know, process it or spin it in a machine. I don't know what they do, um, but they're able to like, you know, kind of figure out how much iron you have in your system. And that is reflected in uh, two numbers, your ferritin and your hemoglobin. Um, ferritin is the, the number that uh, that most runners are looking at. And uh, for women, I, I try and the athletes that I have, if they're aware of their iron, I try and get them all above 50. Um, and ideally within, a, you know, about the 70s or 80s is great. Um, but taking iron supplementation, there's been this... Um, Kind of, there was a a school of thought that's kind of going out of style now. But the school of thought was you need to be taking oh maybe like 120 milligrams a day. But now it's actually you need to be taking quite a bit more than that, Hmm. and you need to be spacing it out throughout the day um, in such a way that you're taking. If you're taking um, like I have my iron pills are like 65 milligrams a piece, um, and before Chicago I was taking you know seven to eight of those a day, spacing them out um, with like two hours in between. Um, which is pretty common on the Zap team, the team that I'm at, and still my ferritin levels been you know in the 70s and 80s. It's nothing crazy. Um, obviously, if your ferritin gets too high, like my mother, um, she's during menopause right now, and she's on a lot of supplements, but she was taking so much iron, hers got too high, and it started to be close to iron poisoning, so she stopped taking oh, wow. it. So, um, knowing what your blood work is is very important because if you're feeling fatigued all the time, you don't know why. Um, you're running hard, but your times aren't being reflected. It's very possible that you are anemic. Um, that is the number one supplement that I, in my opinion, I think every single runner sh- should be taking iron. No, okay, that's good to know. And um, just I've kind of had some uh, when I was coaching at La Salle, we had you know various women were um, taking the pill, um, so the pill, <laughs> taking <laughs> iron pills and um, the other for pill. anemia um, and. Uh, you know, some people said it upset their stomach. And, um, you know, there's different ways you can do it for one, you know, you could do if you if you do get an upset stomach, you could do every other day, you could try out different brands, you could try out different ways, but it, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean, um, 
that you shouldn't take anything at all. You just kind of need to play around with it with your own body. But have you found any other tips? I know you're supposed to take it with um, vitamin C. Is that correct? Right. Like a, with a glass of orange juice. But what would you recommend people take it with if they have so the, stomach the problems? So the two ways that I've seen people take iron in general, uh, well, they're all also, um, if, for those who are su- super serious about it, they need to up their iron quickly. They can actually have injections, which mm-hmm. I've never had done. I, I don't really recommend unless you're kind of like in a desperate situation, your ferritin's like at 11 and you have a marathon in a month. Um, other than that, there's uh, like a ferrous sulfate elixir is a liquid. It tastes like you're drinking a battery, if I'm honest. It's really <laughs> disgusting. Um, but I just mix that with a glass of orange juice and drink it if, I, if I'm if i taking it in a liquid form. Um, and that to me is, that one did upset my stomach actually a little bit. But my advice is if you're taking pills, um, space them out throughout the day. And this is, again, going to be a little gross. Um, but if you are having bowel movements that are extremely dark, that means your body is not absorbing the iron correctly. You're taking too much at a time. Um, so try and space out your iron intake throughout the day, and that should hopefully keep your um, your stomach from getting too upset. And definitely eat when you're taking your iron, although try to avoid calcium, again, because of the absorption problem. Yep. And then what about what form? Because isn't there a ferrous uh, gluconate? There's ferrous sulfate. Is there a, a form that is that is best from what you've uh, from what I've heard, ferrous sulfate is the best, and okay. and the most efficient way to get it your get it into your system is a ferrous sulfate elixir. It'll it'll raise your numbers faster. Um, but for me personally, I just I prefer the pills, and I'm not in a situation now where I need iron immediately, mm-hmm. so I'm okay with taking the pills. Um, and then one thing that you can do is um, take like one day off per week. Don't take any iron. That'll make your body kind of crave it and absorb it better the following day. So that's something you can try is uh, varying the levels a little bit. Okay. All right. Good to know. Um, and once again, you know, Sarah and I, we're not, we're not doctors. We're not physicians. We don't, we don't know the answers here. We're just basing it off our experience and what others have, you know, we've kind of, uh, got from the running world, you know, Sarah's, uh, obviously talked to quite a few, um, other elite runners and we're not, you know, we're, we're talking about some, some serious people here who have been, you know, um, like Olympians and things like that. These aren't, you know, but this again on the other side of that, that doesn't mean that it's this is not applicable to you. We're talking about this just in general from a female perspective. So, um, just wanted to kind of throw that out there. Um, so, is there anything else you wanted to kind of add on this topic before we? Yeah, I mean, I think that the one thing that I just really want to stress to to women who are listening to this is that there is no question that you should not be able to ask. Um, I am, you know, personally, and I know Tina is as well, um, I want to be as accessible as I can to women who have questions about this issue. Um, and I, you know, I don't be embarrassed by any anything that you mm-hmm. can possibly ask me. I've probably gone through it myself. Um, we are all in this together and I've gotten, you know, even questions from a woman who lived somewhere that was very, very restrictive for women. They, um, they actually didn't even sell tampons. And so she was talking to me about race options because she knew she was going to be racing when she was on her period. Um, you know, there are a lot of issues that we face as women and we need to, um, to be willing to reach out because the more we stay silent about it, the more this issue is just going to be buried and, and forgotten about. So, um, so make sure that you're you're seeking out a, you know a woman or a coach or someone that you trust and are able to talk to them about these issues. Yeah, great point. And uh, I just want to mention that um, both Sarah and I, you can uh, email. I'm sure that's okay with you as well. Um, so if you do want to contact us, I will put um, our emails on the show notes, which will be at runnersconnect.net forward slash rc60. But also, if you just want to remember this right now, um, we're both going to be. Um, so mine is Tina at runnersconnect.net Sarah's is Sarah at runnersconnect.net so that should be yeah. with an H yes <laughs> uh, that should be pretty easy for you guys to remember if you do want to reach out and ask us any questions or if you you know just want to talk to someone we're, we're there you know sometimes it's easier to talk to someone you don't know than it is to you know uh, talk to a family member so we're both we're both there but anything else you want to add I got my word. I thought of a word. Oh, want. okay. Yep. <laughs> All right. We'll go into that. <laughs> She's way ahead of it today. I usually have to... <laughs> okay. Um, but just before I get on to that, um, I just wanted to kind of give you the opportunity to um, say uh, a few words of wisdom because um, I just wanted to say before my uh, London marathon, which I did uh, three weeks ago, um, Sarah actually sent me a really uh, cool message uh, before the race, which really was interesting. And Sarah always has these great uh, running analogies, always kind of thinking of, um, you know, very unique and creative, writes poetry, writes great blog posts if you want to check out her blog. And I'll put a link to that. 
Um, but, you know, she said to me about, um, you know, the, the struggles and the ups and downs that runners go through and how um, it's kind of like a book. You know, at the beginning, the heroine uh, struggles, she goes through perils, you wonder if she'll ever make it. But, you know, she always comes out at the end and everything always comes together at the end. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, tell everyone about that because I thought that was really unique and that, you know, Sarah knows how much that meant to me. But um, did you have anything else that you know, runners can listen to and enjoy and kind of think about when they are in tough moments or just any advice you want to kind of throw out there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think of my sister because she, um, my, my older sister, she actually just started running a year or two ago and then she began running for this college and, uh, during cross country, she had this dream season. She won, um, almost every race that she ran and, uh, you know, then this track season, she struggled a lot um, through the early parts of the season, but last uh, yet last night she came out on top. She won the the 10k and the 5k at her championship meet, and and she told me she said, you know, strangely as it is, I I, I actually prefer this season to the cross country season because you don't appreciate the good moments, the good races until you have the bad races to compare them to. So enjoy the bad ones because those are the ones that build character. You don't build character through the easy races, the PRs, the ones that you win with your hands in the air. You build character. When you struggle home with your head down, but decide to get in, get it done anyways. Um, so enjoy the the bad as well as the good. Oh, that's great, and that that's something I feel really uh, passionately about. You know, all, all injuries and all downs, all everything that goes wrong, even though it's horrible during that moment, um, you're always going to be glad in the long run that it happened because, like you said, it, it makes you appreciate it, and it really makes those moments when it does go right feel so much better because yeah. you know what you've been through. So great way to finish up there. So um, yeah, Sarah, so every uh, guest I have uh, give me one word to describe what they would like to become, accomplish, achieve this year. So as you mentioned, you already have your word. Would you like to share what that is? I'm going to cheat a little bit uh, yeah. and make it a phrase, which is uh, bridge the gap, or I guess bridge would be my word. Okay. Um, I, this year, I would hope to, to bridge the gap between um, the thinking of recreational runners that elite runners are are different than they are. Um, I hope to share, you know, through articles, through experience, through coaching, um, that we are all in this together. We all go through the same range of emotion every time we stand on the starting line, every time we cross the finish line. So um, I really just hope to bridge that gap and and um, just kind of embrace the idea that that running covers the whole spectrum and that we all um, get to enjoy it, appreciate it, struggle through it yeah. together. Yeah, definitely. That that's great, and I. I agree with that 100%. I'm, I'm constantly trying to say this as well. And uh, hopefully you've all listening, you've been able to see that Sarah and I are just normal people. You know, we, we don't, we're not some kind of strange superhumans. We, we're just people. And, uh, you know, we have the same concerns as you. And I'm sure Sarah can attest to this, that, you know, when you're standing on a start line, you are looking around you thinking like, oh, is that, who's that person over there? And, you know, you're going to go you through. Remember how to run. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then we're, we, we go through a moment in the race where, you know, you think, I can't do this. Yeah. And that will go through your mind. And you may think, you know, um, oh, what reason do I have to drop out right now? What could I say? Okay. But you have to tell your, you know, we, the same as you, we have those same concerns, but you, you trick, you tell yourself, no, no, I've, you know, worked too hard for this. I'm not doing that now. So yeah. we're the same. We doubt, we struggle. We have to stop in long runs and go to the bathroom just like you. <laughs> <laughs> yep, definitely. I think, yeah. uh, unfortunately, as much as I, I hate to bring this up, I think Paula Radcliffe kind of showed that that one day that she was human uh, yeah. in her marathon. <laughs> so I think that uh, that should have shown it. But hopefully we've given you a bit more insight into that today. Um, well, Sarah, thank you so much for coming on the show. I've enjoyed this. And, uh, you know, it's been great to actually dive into the details rather than, uh, you know, delic delicately uh, bouncing around the edge of it without actually uh, talking about things. So I think this is good. And uh, I'm sure everyone has learned a lot. And um, I definitely have as well. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Well, I think that was the deepest we've ever dived into a topic, but I think that it was really needed and it was really informative. I hope you took as much from it as I did. The resources Sarah and I talked about today can be found at runnersconnect.net forward slash rc60. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to the podcast today. I know there's so many ways you could spend your time and I really, really appreciate it. I would love to hear from you and I've already given you my email. But if you want to leave us a voice message, you actually can do that by going to the show notes, which I mentioned at runnersconnect.net forward slash rc60. And there is a 
bar on the side where you can click to leave a voice message. So feel free to do that if you feel inclined. Have a great week of running and I look forward to talking to you soon.